afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm Fiona Di Domenico, Regional President with the Castle Group. Thank you so much for joining us. Just wanted to take a moment, and for those of you who aren't familiar, tell you a little bit about Castle. So Castle is a Florida-based firm, and we have offices all across the state. We manage over 350 associations across the state, and they're pretty evenly divided between um, homeowners associations and condominium associations. We specialize in communities where we can put at least a one person full time or a team on site. And many of our associations have rentals. So hence the reason for our topic uh, today. But um, we're so glad to have you here. And as Gianna said, uh, any questions that we can answer for you even after this presentation, uh, our door is open. So feel free to reach out. And with that, I wanted to turn it over uh, to Karen and Sarah and they'll introduce themselves and then take us away, guys. We're looking forward to having a great discussion today. Thank you for being here. Thanks, Fiona. And thank you for everyone for attending today. My name is Karen Wanseller. I'm an attorney. I've been practicing for about 24 years. Sarah Webner, my partner at Wanseller and Webner. Um, you've been practicing for how many years now? 10. 10, <laughs> Ten years. And Sarah and I only do association law. We have a number of condominiums, homeowners associations, gated, ungated, high rises, low rises, and everything in between. We represent about 500 associations throughout Florida, most along the I-4 corridor, um, stretching from Jacksonville down to about Sarasota, give or take. And rental restrictions are one of the most common questions that we get. And it can be anywhere from we don't want tenants of any sort to we would love to ride this Airbnb wave and everything in between. So with that being said, um, there's always a difference in personalities in associations and the composition no. of your community. Always. <laughs> so what we would really like is to make this an interactive discussion with those who are participating on the call today. We've received a couple of questions in advance. Um, and we would like to have follow up questions. Uh, Sarah and I like to engage and we found that when we have these conversations take on a life of their own through questions that um, it's a much more interesting webinar. Absolutely. So with that being said, please keep in mind there is a difference between condominiums and homeowners associations as it relates to rentals themselves, whether it's short term or long term. Um, and the quick difference is that if you are a condominium and you want to impose rental restrictions, the condominium owners must opt in for that amendment to apply to them. The Homeowners Association Act does not have this same restriction. So if you are a condo or an HOA, when we're talking about rental restrictions, please let us know. Condos are in uh, their creature statute and they have slightly different laws that apply to them versus the homeowners association that are governed pretty much by a 2004 Florida Supreme Court um, case that does not have this grandfathering theory that, that ties to rental restrictions. So when we have our questions, we might need to differentiate between the two, but otherwise a restriction is a restriction. Now a short-term rental, for instance, here in Orange County where our office is located is anything that's under seven months. And nowadays, I don't think anyone would call seven months or six months or even a four month lease short, but technically that's what they're really talking about. And why? Because it has to do with taxation, um, hoteliers license and taxes in the state. Uh, there is a bill pending that is going to lift all community, um, not community, but county and city restrictions on short term rentals. But that does not affect your HOA. That does not affect your condominium. If your documents have rental restrictions, this new law that's coming into place, which again is all about registering the, the, the tax license, will not apply to you. However, we have clients in Orlando that have no rental restrictions, but are trying to keep Airbnb out of their community. And they're using a city of Orlando ordinance as the basis to prevent rentals. That's going to go away soon on July 1st. So we look at what do you have in your documents? What do we not have in your documents and need to amend and how to get there? If your association has a prohibition on short-term rentals, maybe you have to have a seven month or a 12 month minimum lease. 
that is going to prevent short-term rentals. You cannot rely on no commercial activity as a manner to prevent short-term rentals. The Attorney General's office, dating back to when Pam Bondi was in office, issued what's called an AGO, an Attorney General opinion, stating that renting your home is not commercial activity. I don't agree, but um, that's what we have. That, that's a that's a big one, Karen. I know that we get that question a lot um, and people are very passionate about their opinion on that, that, you know, how can that not be considered, you know, a, a true rental or a business, uh, especially when they're advertising, right? And they're saying this is how much it's going to be. Um, so that's great to know the history behind that. It definitely feels commercial in nature. I mean, you're running basically a hotel business out of your unit or your home. So it feels commercial, but we really can't rely on the commercial provision and the declaration alone. So understanding that the trend at the state legislative level is to encourage and allow these short-term rentals, this conversation is very timely and important. If you have a short-term rental restriction, a prohibition against a short-term rental, that is enforceable by the board of directors. Um, cease and desist letters, pre-suit mediation demands if you're an HOA, pre-arbitration demands if you're a condominium, injunctions for lawsuits, um, but assume you don't. We need to get amendments into your documents and drilling down on the specifics, you're gonna to wanna to at least have an initial term of rent, not less than seven months. I would suggest 12 months. Um, with no more than two in a calendar year so that you don't have someone come in and we've had this happen. They lease it for one year, but after two weeks, the tenant breaks the lease. Magically. Magically, there is no early termination provision. The owner submits another two-week lease going, oh, my tenant terminated. Here's my next one-year term, er, term. And then they terminate after, say, a month. And again, no penalty. So we have to really get specific because people are always trying to find the loopholes around these restrictions. Um, so the devil's in the details, and we try to we try to write it so that there's not an end around the intent. Most of my boards are homeowners. There are, I do have some board members that don't own in the community, which is odd, but it, it can happen. Or they're investment owners and they want to be able to have a rental, but they want a stable community. Or you have the homeowner board member that's a resident and wants a stable community. So I, I get it. I have investment properties um, and I care about the quality of my investment property. I don't want to see the, uh, the properties devalued any more than an owner occupant would. I just want to still be able to rent my property. And that's usually where the friction lies. So the first thing is, do you have enough people who would vote in favor of your amendment? Obviously, if you say we're going to outlaw all amendments, no owner who rents the property or intends to rent the property is going to support this amendment. So we do have to come up with reasonable language. Um, one of the first questions submitted was, can the documents with the requirement of a 100% vote for rentals be amended to lower the percentage? And I believe what the, the question states is that before you can impose a rental restriction, um, you have to have 100% of the membership vote in favor of that amendment. But then you're gonna have another section in the documents that say, maybe you only need 51% or two thirds to amend an existing provision. So to answer that question, you're gonna to have to double check to see whether or not there is a restriction on amending, which happens quite often that says you need two thirds plus vote of the membership to amend, except as to X, Y, Z section. So if there's an exception that states you cannot do any uh, amendment to that 100% requirement, then amending to reduce that amount won't work. If it's silent, then arguably you absolutely can get two thirds of the membership to vote to amend that particular provision. I've ever, I've never seen in our documents, and again, we have about 500 associations. I've never seen one that requires a 100% vote to amend a rental restriction. Um, that, that would be incredibly odd. And I wanted to talk a little bit about what type of rental restrictions are out there. And I know, Sarah, mm -hmm. you have a, a bullet point and list of different types of ways to approach rentals and rental restrictions. One of the biggest things we've been seeing lately, if you're truly 
so there's the two camps of people, the ones that want the short-term rentals and the ones that don't. For associations that don't want them, one of the practical amendments that we've done too is saying, hey, if you buy into this community, you have to live in it for say one year or we're even suggesting two years. And it really kind of discourages the investment buyer from wanting to buy in because of course they don't want to sit on their investment for two years. So most of the time they won't bid at the foreclosure auctions after they see that in the documents because they're saying, hey, you know, we want to be able to put a tenant in there right away. So if you're looking to slow down the rentals, I'd say that's one of your biggest um, tools in your box that you can look to take to the membership to amend. Um, the other one, of course, is lease approval. So doing an amendment where the board has discretion as to who is coming into the community, who is renting, um, and it can include background checks, you know, have they, are there any outstanding rule violations on the property? Um, have they paid their assessments? And it's a great way too to then get owners more incentivized to pay their assessments, get the property looking good because they may want to rent it. So that's another big one that we see. And one of the questions that was submitted, yeah. oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. I was just going to ask because we we see that a lot from a management standpoint. Obviously, big difference between you know typically condos and HOAs, and that in the condo documents, normally there's something in there about rentals and and you know how often you can and you know what kind of background check you have to do, if any. But in HOAs, it's very rare that we're seeing that type of language. Um, do you have a recommendation for HOAs specifically because it, it seems like it's becoming more of an issue in the HOAs only because they're starting from like zero essentially, right? Because we go through their documents and it doesn't even say anything at all about rentals. Do you have kind of a best practice? We do. And this segues into one of the questions was if we're an HOA and we look to create these um, rights of the board to review and approve or deny proposed tenants, does that create liability to the association? And the answer is yes. Whenever you start having these rental restrictions, you do run the risk to having exposure to certain fair housing claims or discrimination claims. So you take that business uh, judgment rule approach. It's a risk reward analysis. So for instance, if all we're doing is putting in a rental restriction whereby the owner needs to submit a signed copy of the lease, identifying all of the adults who will be occupying the home, maybe the, the vehicle tags and registrations in advance, but there's no approval or disapproval right. That's very low in terms of exposure for liability. If you state that the board can deny a lease if the homeowner is delinquent in any monetary obligation to the association, that one's supported by statute. There's very little liability to adding in that type of restriction. Where people get in trouble, is when they want to approve or disapprove a proposed tenant based on criminal background checks or credit reports. First of all, I never recommend using a credit report. If, if they have a trust fund and no income and have never worked a day in their life but they can pay, pay the rent to the landlord, that is not our concern. There is a federal law that would require the association if we deny a proposed tenant to report what's called a negative action to the credit reporting bureaus I have never seen an association get this one right because it's such a little known arcane area of the law. But when you deny someone housing based on credit information, that triggers certain federal laws. So I always recommend put credit aside, maybe an eviction history, but not credit. Criminal background is the one that, that frequently comes up. Now, just by way of um, background, back in the 90s, my first few years, I was a state attorney put people in jail, um, loved my job, had to pay my student loans back, grew up and started my own farm back in the late 90s. But I've never forgotten those days. Criminal law is often misunderstood. The other day I had, um, I had a conversation with a board and a management company where they have the right to look at background checks, but they did not have a promulgated list of what would be an acceptable basis to deny the proposed tenant. It said, okay, great, you can have a background check, but you had no sense. What are we looking for? What are we yeah. looking for? And the first thing that we have to explain is just because a person is arrested, that's not gonna be a reason for a denial because we do have the presumption of innocence. God bless the United States, we have the presumption of innocence. So we took the arrest out of the equation. 
The next one that showed, surprisingly enough, was a juvenile um, matter. Leaving that one aside, because uh, juvenile court has its own rules, its own substantive and procedural laws, and it's not considered a conviction as we have in adult court. So we put that one aside. Then we had a 19-year-old felony case that was reduced down to a misdemeanor, a nonviolent misdemeanor. It was drug dealing down to drug possession, probation, no jail time, technically not an adjudication. So I had to spend a half an hour going through. This is not something you can deny. It, I know it's 10 pages and it looks scary, but there's right. nothing there. So what you do is you have a very set list. Felony convictions within, according to HUD, and this dates back to the Obama administration, anything older than seven years, they're, they're going to start looking sideways at is this discriminatory in its intent or its application um, to a certain uh, group. And according to the HUD memorandum, yes, if you start looking back more than seven years, somehow that's inherently racist. I don't know that there was any data to support that, but we mitigate your liability and say, I don't know, let's not argue, that's the standard, let's use seven years. Any felony convictions within the last seven years that involve crimes against person or property, and that covers your biggies. Um, if you're hurting someone or destroying property, you're what we would consider a violent person, we're gonna say no. Um, I've also had associations say any drug dealing or manufacturing, um, or felony possession, we're going to say no. And um, crimes of moral turpitude, which is usually your felony prostitution or felony DUIs, we're going to say no. Once you start getting down into misdemeanors, you're probably going too strict. Unless you say if you've had three misdemeanor convictions in the last three years, you have to really spell out what is our criteria and then hold firm to it. Yeah, I can tell you from a from a management standpoint, this comes up a lot where the, you know, the manager will call a regional director and says, you know, the board wants to deny this person. And when we ask, you know, well, why? Because the manager has said, you know, it meets the criteria. It's, you know, a, a feeling. Uh, we don't like the way this looks. You know, like you said, it's 10 pages. It can't be good. <laughs> yeah. And our guidance is always, I can't, I can't stress enough uh, to the board members on the call, you know, when you get all this together, first of all, best practice, right? Have it, have a, uh, have a written plan of how you're going to attack these. And then if you're going to deny anything, you have to go through the association attorney and, and get, you know, get a blank on that because there is definitely risk and uh, you don't want to be, uh, people have very strong opinions um, on the board and, and they mean well, but sometimes they can, you know, do more harm than good and put the, put the association in a, in a bad predicament. So. Well, so and not important. that, the individual potential liability to a board member, your directors and officers or your DNO coverage may have an exclusion for some sort of racial discrimination or religious discrimination type lawsuit, which is typically what we see out of these fair housing deprivation related claims. And there is a bandwagon for um, ambulance chasing type attorneys to sue associations under fair housing laws, there's a state level version in the state of Florida and a federal version and they read almost identically, but you're now doubly exposed. It's the attorney's fees provision that these attorneys will happily go out and chase. Um, a few years ago, and Piona, you probably remember this, we were getting around, uh, I think it was New Year's Day two or three years ago, threats from Washington DC based advocacy groups stating that if your association website did not have some sort of button to click to have the um, written word spoken to you, you were denied right. fair housing. This was all about the attorney's fees. This wasn't even a person who owned or lived in our communities. So there are a group of lawyers who look to make a living suing associations for these types of discrimination claims to churn up attorney's fees and cost. Yeah, and it's sad. <laughs> it's sad. We, we, we got rid of most of them um, without paying out a dime. Yeah. Um, luckily, the federal courts stepped in and, and realized that if no one was making a request for accommodation that actually had a right to view our member-only portals, there was no violation. But beware of fair housing and discrimination claims because you could have your insurance carrier come in and say, 
that's an exclusion to your policy, Mr. or Mrs. Uh, board member, you're on your own. Maybe we'll provide you a, a defense, but we won't pay out if there's a claim. And I'm very protective of my board members. You all serve as volunteers. Sarah is the president of her board. I do not live in an HOA. <laughs> Just to give you an idea, um, I feel very strongly and very protective of my boards. It's an amazing job what you do. I just don't want your um, good intentions being twisted and used against you. And that's why typically, too, the other thing that opens up some liability is if you're going to do in-person interviews, we oh, typically oh. kind of discourage it um, because if you deny someone for a good faith basis, um, but maybe they say, oh, well, they just didn't like me in the interview, you know, it can kind of bring some stuff up where if it's just something in on paper that we can objectively just mm -hmm. look at and say, no, you know, he's got a history of you know sexual predator pops so you something that's an obvious good reason for denial and we can lean on that so a couple of my boards have wanted to add in um and one did just because they wanted to run that risk but i always kind of warned them hey the in-person yeah. interviews you know i have to warn you about the risks involved with having that so nothing is better than being able to say i don't know what the person looks like i can't guess how old they are or any other anything else about them other than maybe it's a male, maybe it's a female. Sometimes the name is not even indicative. So the more sure. objective criteria you can look at and the more you can put in writing to where there's no he said, she said, the better you are protected from what I would consider uh, trumped up charges, frivolous charges. Um, so right. put on paper. So, so, yeah. Sorry, one of the one of the questions that we had that did come in was um, they're saying their CCNRs are silent on rentals, so must they be amended in order to initiate? Yes, it sounds like a process. I think is what their question is. So whether it's a condo or an HOA, the answer to that question is yes. You need to have a written process, a best practice. Yeah, and, and, and that needs to be adopted in a formal process. Every declaration, usually it can be found in the general provisions article. Scroll down in your declaration to that portion and they'll say, there'll be a section that says amendment. And usually it's spelled out right there, the percentage you would need to get this passed. But anytime we're restricting the way someone uses their unit, whether we're allowing short-term or not allowing, we need that membership vote. The board gets to set common area rules, usually without a membership vote, you know, the times for the pool, um, how often, how you come in and through the gate, if they're gonna establish some kind of like swipe um, to get in. But anytime you think about restrictions that always need a membership vote is when you're starting to affect how someone uses inside the four walls of, of their home or their condo unit. So yeah. So one of the ways that I found that's very successful from a procedural standpoint to get that membership vote out. So you have the board first put together what they are going to propose as the final language what they would like the membership to vote upon. So we get that first, and then we're gonna take that language, almost as an exhibit, proposed amendment, exhibit A. We're either gonna attach it to a limited proxy that will be used for a special membership meeting, at least 14 days notice. I've seen some documents require at least 30 days notice before you can even have a membership vote on proposed amendments. So I can't stress enough how you have to look at your documents. Like Sarah said, mm -hmm. there's a use restriction that tells you if there are any lease restrictions and there's an amendment provision. If it's silent, that's okay. Um, Condo Act is three quarters of the membership. Homeowners Act is two thirds of the membership. We can get you there even if your documents are two pages. We've seen some very short documents. We can get you there. You have the right to amend one way or the other. But you take what the board considers the final version um, so that's why it's so important for the board to be involved. They put in motion these amendments. They propose it to their membership. Again, you either use a limited proxy. And the limited proxy, it's I tell my proxy holder to vote yes at the meeting for the amendments, or I tell my proxy holder to vote no, or it's left blank and it's quorum only. That's fine. I actually, if your documents allow for it, there's a document that we can create under Chapter 617 Florida Statute. Both HOAs and condos are not-for-profit corporations. Chapter 617 is the Not-for-Profit Corporations Act. There is a document in there referred to as a written consent form by the membership in lieu of membership meeting. Long, terrible name, but pretty self-descriptive. It's, it's, like it's like an absentee ballot. It's kind of like the notes you passed when you were in kindergarten. Check this box if yes, check this box if no. You have the proposed amendment in that written consent form. Proxies are a bit restrictive. 
their one specific membership meeting date plus 90 days if you're going to try, try again because you didn't get quorum or you didn't get the vote. This written consent form, and it's sometimes just referred to as a written instrument, it's valid for one year from the date the owner signs it. You can have copies, can be scanned, faxed, docu-signed. It's, it's, it's a little bit more flexible than the law normally allows for. And because it's valid for one year and it's not tied to any certain date, membership can send it in to board members, to your management team. And what happens is the manager keeps track as the votes are coming in. And once you've cleared that minimal membership vote, you hold a board meeting, so much easier to have. <laughs> and the board yeah. certifies the vote count. And we do a certificate of amendment, the board president and secretary sign off on it. We have the amendatory languages exhibit A, get it recorded in your county's official record books, recording it in the county. So the, the certificate says, we had this many yes votes out of the total voting interest of it carries pursuant to our amendment section xyz signed by the board when it's recorded with the county it is now legally effective you mail a copy of it out to the membership within the 30 days of recordation unless you've mailed it out already in advance and the language didn't change one of my favorite ways to get people to turn in their vote look to have a restriction on sex offenders living in your community the people on the call today would probably be shocked if they knew how few restrictions there are on convicted sex offenders. Most of my boards say, but we have a playground. We're next to a school, we're next to a daycare. More than 50% of the convicted sex offenders do not have that radius restriction as a standard condition of um, their probation. The reason I mention this is when you tell people, so a sex offender could move next door, even if there's a playground in their backyard, and I had this happen a couple of years ago and I get boards calling in a panic saying, how do we get rid of them? You don't, you don't have a restriction, but you can create one. People right. come out and, and with that, that. <laughs> yeah, no, that's a great, that's a great point. And what about people who are already there? So whether it's the sex offender example or just, you know, someone's already rented their home and, and you go through this process, are they grandfathered in or how does that work? So if they're an owner, they're not going anywhere. If they're a family member of the owner and not technically a tenant, but a guest, they're not going anywhere. This is why you want to get out in front of this. If they're a tenant, you allow their tenancy to take its natural termination. And then you tell the owner for an HOA, at least you cannot renew the lease. We're not going to interrupt the lease, but you're not going to be able to renew the lease. Yeah. Condominiums is going to depend on whether or not the owner opted into that restriction. Gotcha. Yeah, and I think this is that uh, owner has again. to say yes. Otherwise, their unit's grandfathered in. If that unit owner didn't say yes, then the condo is your grandfathered in and you get to, to lease. So it's really just waiting then for that owner to change hands. Gotcha. And then the new gotcha. owner and I, is subject. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly why, right? This is a great example of why it's so important to involve the association's attorney because all of these intricacies right? As great as your management team is, um, you know, it, it takes, these types of things take a, a lot of different brain, brain powers, a lot of different experiences to try to figure out what's the best way, you know, to get the outcome that the board wants. So well, that's a great other, example. One of the questions really is a management question. Um, how do we deal with the logistics of once we have rental restrictions in place, how do we enforce them? Because of course, Sarah and I can always come in and threaten legal demands and file lawsuits. Um, if your documents allow for what's called direct eviction rights where the association can stand in the place of the landlord, do the chapter 83 landlord tenant notice and file the eviction suit, great. But on the day-to-day -day basis, before it gets to us, I wanted you to explain how the, the Castle Group team has worked with this with the different restrictions in your communities over the years. Yeah, it's, it's a great question. So it's process. It's really process driven. And it really requires uh, the team from a from management plan to have a written plan on exactly what happens. So, you know, lease comes in and then here's like the check the box. Here's the 10 steps that need to happen, you know, with that lease or that potential renter. Um, and that's fairly straightforward for the most part where it's a little complicated. There's two areas. When we have a community that is um, gated or has amenities where you need like a key fob or something to get in, that's actually very helpful for management because it helps us 
quote unquote catch people. Um, you know, they have to come into the management office. They have to register because they literally want to be able to use the pool. They want to go into the workout facility, especially in our communities in the Cassini area where we, we truly have, you know, what I, what I call short-term rentals, which to me is nightly or, you know, two or three nights at a time. Those people, we have a very strict process where we get with, um, as the management company, we get with the uh, short-term rental management companies that are working with our owners. And we say, hey, guys, we're all on the same team here, right? We want the guests to have a phenomenal experience because we want them to come back. And so you're, and that's what your owner wants, right? Your owner wants a full, fully occupied, 100% occupancy all the time. In order for that to work, we all have to work together. And sometimes when we take on a new community, what we find is the rental management companies and the property management company are not working together. They're, they're talking like this. So it's very important that we, we literally bring them in. Um, you know, we have lunch with them as a vendor. Okay, guys, here's, here's going to be the process. You know, uh, do you see any holes in this process for your, you know, uh, guest experience? What can we do to make it easier? Because we don't want to make it an arduous process for the owner or for the tenant. Um, we want to make it as streamlined as possible. And so we're having it organized, well laid out, and then educate uh, the people that are going to be involved in that process. We have them typically check in, literally like they would check into a hotel. So they're checking in at the front desk. We give them a whole little mini welcome package. We give them a little mini tour of the facility. You know, it's like almost like a concierge type service. We make sure we, they understand the rules, right, which is super important. Um, and, and then send them on their way. Where it gets a little bit more tough is when you don't have a gate, you don't have, you know, a key fobs, amenities, it maybe it's just a very simple, um, you know, pool and cabana area that almost anybody can access with no gate. That gets a lot tougher to try and monitor. And we get, um, we get greatly creative on that because what we're doing is when we're doing our, what we call our, our drive through the communities, you know, we're looking and we show, okay, well, the garbage came out, you know, this week, but then it hasn't come out for four weeks, you know, things like that. You can start to figure out. Um, and your neighbors, right? We want to make sure that we're communicating well with the neighbors because the neighbors are the best resource. They'll tell you if they're seeing people coming in with suitcases, you know, Friday night at 11 p.m. and they're leaving Sunday morning on a continual basis. Um, we want that information from the residents because we want to help educate and again and then reach out. The other thing we do is we uh, surf uh, the sites, the VRBO, the Airbnb, and we're looking for um, you know, uh, communities or for homes in our communities where we know, we know they don't allow rentals and we recognize, right. The photos and pictures, they may not have an address, but, and then we go back and make sure that we've got very clearly documented in the violations and covenants process, you know, what, what defines a violation of, of that. So advertising on Airbnb for nightly rentals, when you only are allowed to do, let's say a 30 day rental. So we train the team on all those different things and educate the board. I know that was a long answer, but it's a, it's oh, a long process. <laughs> it's perfect because it segues into, remember, if we're going to file a lawsuit for an injunction to stop an owner's improper use, we have the burden of proof. We have to prove that they're using their property in this manner. Sarah and I one time had um, a person, a board member, go book a reservation and print out the reservation and bring it to us yeah. we're like exhibit a um that case yeah. got settled very quickly after the owner was like oh no 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 it's my 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 cousin-in-law's stepbrother's twin something odd um <laughs> we have yeah. to prove it now honestly for an yeah. hoa we don't need evidence to tender a pre-suit mediation demand when we have all of these suspicions of violations because we're just like well we have a dispute we, we think you're, this is what you're doing. Let's go mediate. <clears throat> but I, I don't like to bluff. I want to have a good poker hand. I want to just yeah. lay it out there and say, here is how we can prove your violence. So we always ask um, owners to send us copies of the screenshots of the VRBO or the Airbnb listing. The same with management. Now we can look to get an injunction, um, a court order yeah. prohibition. That's an extreme case. It's one we don't normally have to take 
Um, evictions, again, if we have direct eviction rights or we ask the owner to evict problematic tenants is usually more common practice for enforcement. But fines and fining and suspension, you have to have the fining and suspension committee in place. So board members cannot serve on this committee, unlike architectural review where they can do a, a dual role board and ARC simultaneously. The statutes, both statutes, prohibit the board serving as the finance suspension committee. If you have a person who's violating these rental restrictions and you send the owner to hearing, and it is substantiated that the owner has violated um, the short-term rental restrictions or any rental restrictions for that matter, suspend their use rights because it now applies not only to the owner, but any tenant, any guest. So for some of our rentals at the resort HOAs, that's a huge deal. If a, if a tenant's coming in and they're trying to gain access to the, to the pool or the clubhouse, and they're told, no, I'm sorry, that use right is suspended as it relates to the property you, you rented, you're gonna have a very angry tenant who probably yeah. shouldn't be and, there anyway, but they don't know that. And all but it's, but it's a great that. point. We, we see it from the management standpoint all the time um, and board members can't cave, right? This is the key because um, we are always telling the boards, you know, we're gonna do this and we're gonna implement the process and there's gonna be people at the gate or at, you know, at the pool that we're gonna to have to nicely say, you know, you can't come in and you, they're gonna find you. Somehow, some way your phone is gonna ring and it's gonna be somebody really angry. And the minute you say, okay, you know, I feel bad because you're the third cousin of whatever and it's you know, 11 o'clock on a Friday night, the minute you cave, the whole, the whole process caves. Um, so we, we have to be firm and, you know, firm and fair, as we, as we like to say. Well, and while this is a little bit outside of the, the topic for today, I feel very, very strongly about boards establishing finding and suspension committees because it gives you the ability to police your own disputes without involving legal and legal fees. So strange that I'm saying this, but <laughs> for a lot of these things, you don't want to come to us because it's expensive and slow the finding and suspension committee, it's, it's HOA jury duty. They gather up, they hear the violation, guilty, not guilty. If it's guilty, the board will impose the fine or suspension or both. And I found that most owners actually do become compliant, probably about 90% yeah. of them fall into compliance with just the use of the finding and suspension committee. Um, and sometimes, and maybe this is true, and maybe I'm cynical, the owner says, I just really didn't understand the restriction but you have a jury of your homeowner resident peers saying, that's a violation. We live here. What you're doing is a violation. And it does actually bring about compliance and not many repeat offenders. So boards take back not only our rental restrictions, a process, an amendment process, um, written consent forms are the best way to get you there. But consider setting up a finance suspension committee to help with the enforcement. You can write every law you want. If you can't enforce it, the jurisprudence is, was it worth it? Probably not. Um, you want to be able to enforce what you put into motion. The finance suspension committee is a brilliant tool on rental restrictions. Yeah. And just a reminder for our, um, for our, our, our listeners, go ahead and chat in your questions. If you have questions, we are monitoring the chat and we are um, working through the questions that were sent in before, uh, before today. Um, one of the questions we do have is talking about renters meeting age restrictions. Yes. Can you guys touch on that a little bit? Absolutely. So the first rule of thumb is they have to be over the age of 18. Anyone under 18 cannot sign a contract in Florida. It's not a legally binding lease. Um, doesn't come up often, um, but it does every now and then. Uh, my 17 year old son wanted to rent a commercial space for basically, I think he wanted to start a fight club. <laughs> we discouraged that. And when I said, well, baby, you're not 18 yet. You can't sign off on any lease agreement. He was, oh, okay, fair. That's, a, that's an odd one. It doesn't come up very often, but I think the question was probably more along the lines of 55 plus or 62 plus communities. So there is a federal law called, we, the acronym is HOPA, H-O-P-A. It's the Housing for Older Persons Act. And it's, um, there's, there's two types of age-restricted communities, 55 and up and 62 and up. You rarely see 62 and up. 62 and up is 100% 62 and up. No wiggle room, no, no wiggle room of any sort. 
and they can fully and freely discriminate based upon age without violating federal law because age discrimination typically is an actionable discrimination. The other one that you mostly see in Florida is the 55 and up communities. They have to follow what is called the 80-20 rule. 80% 80 of the occupants, not necessarily the owners, um, like Sarah, who is much, much younger than I am, um, she could buy a home, but then have her dad, who's 68, 69 years old, live in it. It's the occupant whose age matters, not the owners. Now, Sarah can't move in if there's an 80-20 issue, but as long as you have 80% or more of the residents, 55 years of age and up, you have this 20% where you do have to allow people under the age of 55 to live there, but no one at any point in time under the age of 19. So yes, you have 55 and up, but Sarah being a 30 something can live in it as long as there's room under that 20% um, allowance. We actually get this quite often where younger people wanna live in a 55 plus community because there's no kids. They can have adult only swim time without violating federal law. So the grandkids have to wait. They can come and visit, but they're not gonna be swimming in the association pool during adult swim times. Um, it's a license to discriminate based on age. Um, and that's why people do like to buy into these age restricted communities. If you are not an age restricted community, in no way, shape or form, can you take into account a person's age as a qualification HOPA communities are registered with the state. They have to do basically biannual census. They have to prove that they're following their 80-20 rule and what they're doing to maintain their age distinction. If you are not registered as a HOPA community, it is incredibly hard to ever become one. It would almost take a, a common buyer buying up 80% of the homes and making it happen. So if you're already in one, yes, you can discriminate based on age. If you are not already in one, nope. Yeah, no can do. One of the questions I know I've I've gotten from boards, um, specifically more in our in our tower communities that are in maybe high, um, like on the beach, for example, where they do rentals. They said, well, Fiona, I see on Airbnb it says, you know, you can't rent unless you're 25. You know, kind of like how you can't rent a car. You know, they're trying to get it. They're trying to get away from the college crowd. Uh, coming, and they've posed that question of, can we make a rule that says, no, you can't make, you know, you can't rent here unless, you know, you're X number of years old. So it sounds like the answer is no. <laughs> and the reason why is, and the car companies can get away with it because they're not a housing provider. So they're treated differently. They're not governed by the Fair Housing Act. Um, the Fair Housing Act has uh, familial, what is it, familial status? Is that yeah. what, basically families with children can't discriminate based on families with children. You can't even say, really, you can't even say no kids. Um, although I did see a hotel, but hotels again are housing providers. I was looking for hotel rooms in Vegas and I saw one that said no kids. I'm like, that's different. Um, I guess three, right. <laughs> but it was a hotel. Um, but that home sounds home like fun. <laughs> um, but Welcome to Vegas. <laughs> Yeah, it was a boring reason. I'm supposed to be going there for an archery competition. Um, not, not, the, not the normal reason you go to Vegas. But um, so they're not a housing provider. Associations under federal law are deemed housing providers. So the Fair Housing Act applies to us for both owners as well as renters, as well as guests of the owners. Um, and sometimes that touches upon uh, medical accommodations for guests, but that's again outside of what we're talking about today. So just remember, you're a housing provider. You can't discriminate based on age, children, or any of what we call the protected classes. And that comes up too. Just and this is going off topic again, but we've had a lot lately. We're kind of moving around um, pool restrictions. So we've seen this come up a lot with the pools. So if you have a community pool that says, "Hey, no one under say 13 years old without an adult," technically that's a fair housing violation. And and there are attorneys out there that literally scope out for pools having age restrictions mm -hmm. on the pool mm -hmm. to get these associations in trouble. So we always recommend to have your pool signs say something more about the, towards the ability of the swimmer, not necessarily their age. That way you're, you know, you're safe bet Interesting. Mm -hmm. One of my associations actually has it built into their documents, the original covenants, conditions, and restrictions, 
uh, no one under 12 without parental supervision. And we're inheriting these documents. And I tell the board, hey, we're not gonna have our sign mimic the CCR and we're not gonna be able to enforce it. There are times when there's um, a legality that bars enforcement and we almost have to put out a notice saying, we might not be able to get the vote to amend that out of there, but we're not going to enforce it as written. So don't, don't bother suing us. We're not enforcing that. Um, gotcha. Cause I see that a lot in um, the pools and in the, um, in the, uh, in the gyms, right? Mm -hmm. Nobody well, under the yeah. age of can use the equipment. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, okay. um, and again, other than our, our age restricted communities, which can discriminate freely on age, um, go to town. <laughs> why you bought there? Um, the, right. the reason why, and it, it goes back to a California case where the, it said no, no minor children unaccompanied by a parent. Well, of course, it was bad facts and it made fun law. It was a 17 year old who was barred from the pool because he didn't have his dad with him. Well, his dad did not know how to swim. And the 17 year old was a certified lifeguard. Boom, 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 go to the federal courts. And the court said this has to be based on ability. So you can't say no kids in diapers. You have to say no person in diaper because there's case law out there saying there might be a, an octogenarian in diapers. So try not to use minor children by age or by reference in, um, in your restrictions. And again, you cannot restrict a tenant for having a child as, uh, and, and you don't even ask really. I do have one association where we do occupancy, where we count anyone over the age of two toward um, a total occupancy because we have a restriction. Number. Yeah, be like two be per, bedroom. per bedroom for occupancy standards for leases and occupancy. Um, mm -hmm. no more than X number of anyone over the age of two, the square footage of the home. So you can take them into consideration as far as occupancy uh, maximums, if your documents allow for that. That's really more condos or townhouses necessarily yeah. than single family. Although I do have some single families where they're short-term rentals. Um, it's two per bedroom plus one per den and one per living room um, as a an occupancy restriction. And what about renting part of a home? I, I see that a lot where the, you know, the, the, in a single family community, you, you can't rent, you can't rent a room. Mm -hmm. Our rule is, is that fine? It has to be a rental restriction. So most of your associations might have at least the soft language, maybe not clearly on point, but arguably the intent. That's a single family use only. Now, typically the definition of what is a familial unit is uh, blood, marriage, adoption. That's what makes you family. Um, and if you don't have that, you might have a boyfriend, girlfriend, domestic partner situation where it's the two of them in a relationship, but they're unrelated by blood, marriage, or adoption because they're not married. Um, Anything outside of more than two unrelated persons is arguably multifamily. So if you have a single family use only, now having a roommate thrown into the mix, to me, that's not single family purpose, but you should have a restriction that says no by the room rentals. You don't want the boarding house. A number of our associations that are near right. colleges have this problem constantly mm -hmm. it's a boarding house it's an off-campus frat party um every weekend right. working on the grass with 20 cars it yeah. can become a problem so you want in your documents to say no by the room rentals whole house rental only that way the owner's not bringing on roommates constantly um and it better defines what is single family use Gotcha. We have a, a, a question that came in because we're running out of time. So this is from Keith and he says, our documents state all units must be occupied by a person 55 or older. Is that portion of our documents enforceable? Mm -hmm. Could a restriction be that units may be only rented to someone 55 or older? Now he doesn't say if he's in a 55 or plus community. Or we're, gonna, we're gonna assume you are in a 55 plus community because otherwise the answer is absolutely can't, can't get there. Um, but assuming you're in a HOPA community and you're 55 plus, you have to look at what your 80-20 rule allowance is for. So if you already have 90% of the residents over the age of 55, um, you could rent to someone under. Usually it's the owner saying, I don't care. I just want to rent the property to someone who's going to pay the rent. So the idea that tenants only as a class must be 55 and over, 
because it's far easier to track ownership information than resident information. I don't know of anything that would say that's per se in violation of the, uh, the HOPA and the fair housing laws as they relate to HOPAs. Okay, great. Um, I'm not seeing any other questions. Did you guys have anything else you think we should uh, chat about before we uh, I think we, we think covered all. There was one question about anticipating a generational mind shift. And I didn't know what, I honestly didn't understand the question. So if the person who asked that question is on the line and wants to clarify, um, otherwise we have gone over all of the advanced questions. Uh, I think our, our parting word would be rental restrictions when we write them, they, they tend to turn into the length of a Bible when we have everything thrown in there, because the more specific, the more objective the criteria, the more you can say here is where it's not permitted, the safer the board and the association in terms of liability. If you're a developer, you're probably not going to want rental restrictions because you want to be able to sell to the largest pool of buyers that are out there. If you're a post turnover community and you're concerned about investment buyers coming in droves, um, you want rental restrictions such as what Sarah mentioned initially. No, you can own it, but you cannot rent it. It can be an owner occupancy or a true second home for the first two years. And investor owners steer clear of those. I have one where we have that restriction in place. It's recorded. The new owner just missed it and tried renting it. We shut it down immediately. And we even had a, a provision there where we would disgorge their profits if they rented in violation. She put the house on the market the next week, not realizing what she bought into. No investor is going oh, to want to show the house. But yeah. then you live there a few years, your family is growing, you're looking at upsides and you want to keep it maybe as an investment property. It gives your owners maximum flexibility while encouraging an owner occupancy community. Uh, that that's one of my favorite restrictions um, because it's much easier whether you're gated or ungated. It's a pretty easy one to track and enforce. I do like at least having the leases on file so that we know the names of the tenants. And if there is a problem, yeah. the owner or the leasing agent for the owner is now known to the association for the operational and the logistics that Fiona's group and our group deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. And if you want to dip your toe into approval and denial, do so very carefully with a very, very good set of grounds to justify your denial and skip the in-person interview. Don't do it. <laughs> Please don't do it. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. Consult with the experts. Definitely work with your management team and your attorney. Don't, don't go it alone. That's what, that's what these webinars are all about. Don't go it alone. Well, so, uh, you Karen and Sarah, <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. We appreciate it. We appreciate all of the questions and we appreciate the assistance Thank Castle you. Group for putting together the, the slides that have been coming up on the screen and for getting the questions to us in advance. Um, we hope you all have a great day. Absolutely. Thanks everybody. Really appreciate your time, ladies. Look forward to doing this again with you in the future. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Uh, Bye. -bye. Bye.